Good evening, and welcome to our second Wednesday Lewis Guy History Series program. Tonight, you will be hearing um, a program called Sailors and Slaves, USS Constellation and the Transatlantic Slave Trade. Our speaker is John Pentangelo, who is the director of the Hampton Roads Naval Museum. He was formerly the curator at the USS Constellation Museum, so he has a real history with that ship. He has a master's degree in history museum studies from the Cooperstown graduate program. Um, a couple of little housekeeping details for you as you watch the program um, and surely have questions. You'll notice that there is a chat button and also a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You'll type your question into one of those boxes. I will be collecting them throughout the program and we will throw them all at John at the end of the program. Um, feel free to just ask away. I am so glad that we are able to continue to have our programs through the miracles of technology, even while we're not able to meet in person. You know, I hope that this won't last and we'll be back together in person soon. But in the meantime, we like to be able to give you your monthly history fix through Zoom. Um, thanks to our webmaster, Jason Smith, for making that possible. So without further ado, I am going to turn the program over to John Pentangelo. So tell us all about your topic. And well, thank good you. Evening. Oh, thank you very much. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, Thank you for that wonderful introduction, uh, Peggy, and for the Norfolk Historical Society for inviting me here to speak tonight. Um, it's a great thrill for me. Um, my first full-time museum job after graduate school was at USS Constellation Museum in Baltimore. And they are the custodians of the Sloop of War USS Constellation uh, built in, uh, well, launched, I should say, in 1854, right here in, uh, in Norfolk. Uh, at the shipyard. Um, while I was there, a descendant of a crew member who had served on board the ship while she was flagship of the African squadron, this was right before the Civil War, uh, called us up and said, hey, I, I have this journal from my, my ancestor who served on board the ship. Uh, I'd like to show it to you. And we said, okay, great. Uh, and anybody who's ever worked in a museum or has studied anything passionately knows that when somebody brings you new information, it's always exciting. But this was even more exciting because uh, those of you who study naval history, especially the age of sail, um, <clears throat> you might be familiar with the deck logs at the National Archives, which tell you day to day where a certain ship was, uh, what it was doing, uh, and who was on board and the like. Well, the deck logs for this cruise mysteriously do not exist in the National Archives, the deck logs for Constellation. Uh, so this was something like a Rosetta Stone for us. It gave us all this information. It was very exciting. Um, and I'm not, I wasn't a trained Naval historian, uh, but I grew to love this very niche topic and, and have, have researched it quite a bit um, and did an exhibit uh, about it, uh, wrote some, some material on it uh, for, uh, Naval War College Press and um, Sea History Magazine. So it's a fun, it's, a, it's an interesting topic to me about uh, a very serious topic. And not a lot of people know that the Navy was involved uh, fighting the slave trade. Uh, so I look forward to discussing that in detail. Um, I don't want to talk to you simply about Constellation because I know about it, but the service at the, uh, the service of this ship while it was in Africa is really important to the history of the African squadron itself. Um, the African squadron is a very, very poor reputation amongst historians and is largely believed to be a failure. Um, it's kind of hard to argue. Um, but the period that Constellation was there from 1859 to 1861 was one of uh, remarkable progress and uh, the, the squadron had performed more efficiently and with better results than it ever had before. So it really is an important uh, time period. Um, I'm going to talk about Constellation a little bit. 
I'm going to talk about why she was in Africa and give you a little bit of a history of the slave trade. Um, I'm going to talk about the African squadron itself, how it came to be. And then I'm going to talk very specifically about Constellation's time there uh, with great detail about her capture of the slave ship Cora uh, on September 25th, uh, 1860, uh, with 705 Africans on board. Uh, it's quite possibly the most dramatic moment, single day of the ship's century of service. So uh, I have a script here and I'm going to get right down to it and I look forward to addressing your questions. I'm going to share my screen now so that you can see the slides. Okay, all right, hopefully everybody can see that slide there. Okay, from 1859 to 1861, USS Constellation served as flagship of the United States Navy's African Squadron, a fleet of eight vessels that had orders to protect American commerce and suppress the transatlantic slave trade off the coast of Western Africa. Before I discuss the slave trade, the US Navy's role in fighting it and Constellation's time off the African coast, I wanna take a step back and give a brief overview of the vessel itself, as she had a very long career in the United States Navy. The ship, as I mentioned, was launched just across the river uh, in the Gosport Navy Yard in 1854, which is now, of course, known as the Norfolk Naval Shipyard. When her keel was laid in 1853, it was done within sight of the old frigate constellation, one of the first six frigates in the United States Navy. That constellation was launched in 1797 in Baltimore and was thought then at the time to be the oldest ship in the United States Navy. Uh, through the 19th and 20th century, there was a great deal of confusion about the second constellation, actually being a rebuild of the first. She most certainly was not a rebuild. The Sloop of War constellation, which I'm talking about today, pictured here in this beautiful uh, oil painting by Tommaso di Simone in the Bay of Naples, um, was launched in 1854, and she was an all-new design. She's the last all-sail vessel designed and built by the U.S. Navy, and the only vessel still afloat today to have seen active service during the Civil War. USS Constitution, of course, was in service during the Civil War, but was a essentially more or less a stationary uh, practice ship for the Naval Academy. Um, if you go to the Naval Academy, uh, the museum there, you can see the half hull builder's model of Constellation, which would not exist if it was simply a rebuild. She's not a part of any class of ships, and she was much larger than your average sloop of war. And a sloop of war is a vessel with its main battery on one gun deck, uh, whereas a frigate has batteries on both a gun deck and an upper spar deck, and a ship of the line has multiple gun decks. The sloop of war only has one. So Constellation's main battery consisted of 16 eight-inch shell guns. She also carried four 32-pound long guns that fired solid shot. On her spar deck, she was built to carry two 10-inch pivot guns fore and aft. In Africa, the pivot guns were removed entirely, and instead they mounted boat howitzers on the spar deck. One of those boat howitzers, the only surviving piece of Constellation's armament, can be found in Trophy Park on the Norfolk Naval Shipyard. There it is. Constellation's career has been called a century of service. By the time she had been decommissioned for the last time in 1955, the Navy had transitioned from wood to iron, from sail to steam, and all the way to nuclear power with the launching of the submarine Nautilus. Her first cruise was with the Mediterranean Squadron. After that cruise, she sailed to Africa. During the Civil War, she was stationed in the Mediterranean again, serving in a largely diplomatic role, a demonstration that even with a civil war raging and a naval blockade in effect, the US Navy could still carry out its typical functions around the world. Before the war was over, she spent time in the West Gulf blockading squadron, but not really suited to blockade duty because of her deep draft. She was ordered to Norfolk and finished the war as a receiving ship, sort of like a floating barracks. She's altered after the Civil War and transferred to the Naval Academy for use as a practice ship. So she would teach, uh, midshipmen would go on board 
and they would practice gunnery and seamanship and go on practice cruises. Uh, during this time, she's dispatched to Ireland on a famine relief mission, that's in 1880, and then to Europe to carry art and artifacts back to the United States for the Columbian Exposition in 1892. In 1893, she sails for the last time and ends up in Newport, Rhode Island to serve for many years as a permanently moored recruit training ship. This time she's teaching not officers, but newly enlisted sailors, and she's teaching them the basics of life at sea. In 1941, she will serve as Admiral Ernest J. King's relief flagship of the Atlantic Fleet. And for six months in 1942, she will actually serve as the flagship of the Atlantic Fleet under Admiral Royal Ingersoll. Imagine that, a wooden warship, flagship of the Atlantic Fleet in the age of the aircraft carrier and the submarine. After the World War II, she is towed to Boston to be moored next to what was then believed to be her sister ship, Old Ironsides, USS Constitution. And finally, she is decommissioned in 1955 and towed to Baltimore to serve as a floating relic. It is both a tragedy and a miracle that she was believed to be one of the first six frigates. A tragedy because so much of her historic integrity was destroyed during the 1960s to make her look like the original Baltimore built 1797 frigate. But a miracle because had she been believed only to be a mildly engaged Civil War era vessel and not believed to be the oldest ship in the US Navy launched in 1797, she certainly would have been sold or left to sink at her birth like the USS Hartford did in 1956. Instead, she was saved and she survives as a historic naval ship interpreted in her Civil War configuration, the last floating vessel to have seen active service during the Civil War, and the only historic naval vessel from the Navy's age of sail. She has more original timber in her than USS Constitution, <clears throat> excuse me, which has of course been rebuilt many times. And that is her a relatively recent picture in Baltimore's Inner Harbor. So what is this venerable ship doing off the coast of Africa from 1859 to 1861? She's part of the United States Navy's African squadron, the only squadron out there that was specifically created with a mandate from Congress. The United States had outlawed the transatlantic slave trade and needed some way to enforce those laws. But let's go back a bit further and talk about this barbarous trade denounced even then as a global atrocity. The transatlantic slave trade was the largest forced migration of people in history. European colonies in North and South America offered valuable resources such as gold, silver, sugar, tobacco, and cotton. To mine these precious metals and grow these cash crops, merchants and plantation owners used African slaves. Merchants then traded these goods all over the globe, generating massive wealth for the world's great maritime powers of Britain, France, Portugal, Spain, and the American colonies, later the United States, and others. The trade in Africans became the central element in the development of European and American nations in a global economy founded on slave labor. During the nearly 400 years the slave trade flourished, from 1500 to 1867, an estimated 12.5 million Africans were captured and carried across the Atlantic Ocean as slaves. The issue of slavery and the slave trade was hotly debated in the early years of our national existence. When the United States declared independence from Great Britain on July 4th, 1776, that declaration almost included a denunciation of George III's role in the slave trade as, when, as one of his many abuses of power. Thomas Jefferson, a slaveholder, wrote, in, uh, wrote that denunciation in, but many of his fellow Southern delegates objected and the line was removed. Since the exports in cotton, tobacco, and rice were produced by slave labor in the states of Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, slavery was the bedrock of their economy. Northern states shipped and traded crops produced by slaves and used slave labor on small farms and in support of business ventures as well. But as difficult as it might be to understand, many of those who still supported slavery did not actually support the inhumanity of the slave trade. The triangle trade, as it was also known, uh, went something like this. Ships from Europe would carry trinkets and guns and metals to Africa to purchase slaves. The slaves were carried across the Atlantic on a journey known as the Middle Passage, 
and were sold at auction in the markets of the Caribbean and South America and North America. The ship was then refitted to take a cargo of that market's cash crop, could be sugar or molasses from the Caribbean or tobacco from Virginia. As the, Amer as the American colonies matured, they increasingly replaced Europe as a point of origin. Though the slave trade was eventually outlawed in the US, American involvement persisted with financial investments, American ship captains, American built vessels, and logistical support in the nation's great seaport cities. Look at the map here for a minute. I want you to notice two things. One is, look at the giant bar uh, coming from the mouth of the Congo River, where it says West Central Africa. That's where most of the Africans are, are, are coming from. Uh, of course, they're coming from all over the interior, but they're leaving uh, the continent from the Congo River uh, Basin. Also to pay attention to where they're going. Uh, we're tempted to think so many of the slaves came to the colonies of the United States, but you can see comparatively, very few of them did. The vast majority are going to Brazil or into the Caribbean, specifically in Cuba. Before Africans embarked from a slave ship for a transatlantic crossing, they were captured from their villages all over the interior and, interior and marched to a slave fort, sort of a market and a prison all in one. Often the Africans were kidnapped by members of rival tribes or slave catchers employed by dealers. They were marched from the villages in the interior to the west coast in a coffle, that's that long line you see there, and you can see them confined and bound in what's called a gori or a slave stick. It's sort of a branched fork with an iron bar that's keeping them bound at the neck. So the Africans were taken to a slave castle or a slave fort known as a barracoon. Eventually, when purchased, they were brought to a ship waiting offshore. Certainly, you can imagine uh, there was a great deal of confusion, shock, and horror. Most of these Africans never saw a white man and most probably never saw the ocean either. Aluda Equiano, a former slave who endured the Middle Passage from Africa, there he is in set in that uh, wonderful portrait. Uh, he wrote in 1789, the first object which saluted my eyes when I arrived on the coast was the sea and a slave ship, which was then riding at anchor and waiting for its cargo. These filled me with astonishment, which was soon converted into terror when I was carried on board. He continued, I now saw myself deprived of all chance of returning to my native country, or even the least glimpse of hope of gaining the shore, which I now considered as friendly. And I even wished for my former slavery in preference to my present situation, which was filled with horrors of every kind, still heightened by my ignorance of what I was to undergo. I was not long suffered to indulge my grief. I was soon put down under the decks, and there I received such a salutation in my nostrils as I had never experienced in my life. So that with the loathsomeness of the stench and the crying together, I became so sick and low that I was not able to eat, nor had I the least desire to taste anything. I now wished for the last friend, death, to relieve me. Equiano is describing the horrible conditions of the Middle Passage, and his descriptions will be echoed by naval officers and sailors of the African squadron throughout the years. Many of you might be familiar with this illustration. Uh, it's an image that's often used in books, exhibits, and documentaries that discuss the slave trade. Uh, this drawing shows the regulations for packing a slave deck during the Middle Passage. British groups printed and distributed this broadside widely to galvanize a growing movement to abolish the practice of slave trading, since even after regulations were established, traders were still cramming too many people on board. To maximize profits, slavers packed hundreds of Africans below decks with no room to stand and little room to move. The hold or a slave deck of a ship offered almost no ventilation, so suffocating heat, rolling seas, and poor food caused great suffering. Poor sanitation during a crossing that could last up to two months left many Africans lying in their own filth and caused disease to spread with shocking speed and severity. It is believed that one fifth of all Africans carried across the ocean died in transit before the trade ended in the 1860s.
Such conditions aroused sympathy among the citizens of the world who called upon their governments to end the trade in Africans. In the late 1700s and early 1800s, a public outcry for the abolition of the slave trade grew steadily. Many Americans too called for an end to the trade because of the suffering and death caused by this confinement. The United States and Great Britain led the rest of the world in restricting and outlawing the trade, but their historic rivalry restricted cooperation between the two nations. Though dangerous and illegal, slave traders used this rivalry to escape naval patrols and carry slaves to Cuba and Brazil with alarming frequency. So in 1787, the United States Constitution declared that Congress could not prohibit the importation of slaves into the United States until 1808. So during the Constitutional Convention that year, many delegates were in favor of giving Congress the power to tax the importation of slaves or prohibit this trade altogether. South Carolina and Georgia had faced a labor shortage on their rice and cotton plantations, and their representatives represent, resented, excuse me, any measures to restrict the trade as a move to weaken Southern states and eventually abolish slavery. Though the Northern states and the Upper South supported an end to the trade, resistance from these two states was strong enough to force a compromise. A fragile political union of the 13 states was ultimately responsible for denying the federal government the ability to outlaw the importation of slaves into the United States for another 20 years. Although the Constitution prohibited Congress from abolishing the slave trade before 1808, individual states were free to take the initiative whenever they pleased. And by 1806, South Carolina was the only state that had not restricted the slave trade. In 1807, Parliament abolished the slave trade throughout the British Empire. Britain's leaders recognized that the Royal Navy was the largest and most powerful in the world. They sought to use the Navy to police the waters off of Africa for other nations. Parliament encouraged foreign governments to outlaw the trade and then negotiated treaties to obtain the right for the Royal Navy to stop and search suspected slave ships flying foreign colors. By 1817, Portugal, Spain, France, and the Netherlands abolished the slave trade. By 1840, these nations, now joined by Sweden, the Italian states, and many South American countries, including Brazil, agreed to abolish the trade and grant the Royal Navy the right to search their vessels. These efforts culminated in the Quintuple Treaty in 1841, when England, France, Russia, Prussia, and Austria agreed to suppress the slave trade and search each other's vessels. Who's missing? Despite Britain's repeated attempts to enter into a treaty with the United States, Congress refused to give the Royal Navy the right to search American flag vessels even if they were suspected as slave ships. In 1839, two circumstances forced Americans to compromise on the right of search. A British ship, the HMS Buzzard, captured two American slave ships, the Eagle and Clara, and escorted them into New York Harbor. Three more British captures followed. The actions of the Royal Navy sent the message that Britain would enforce US laws against the trade in the absence of an American presence in Africa. That same year, the famous Amistad incident forced America to confront inadequate enforcement of their slave trade laws. The Spanish vessel was transporting recently purchased African slaves from one part of Cuba to another. The Africans revolted and killed the captain. The 53 Africans then demanded that two surviving Spanish crew members take them back to Africa. Instead, the Spaniards sailed north and ended up in the custody of a U.S. revenue cutter off Long Island Sound. The Spanish government demanded the return of the vessel and the cargo, but the case eventually went to the Supreme Court, which freed the Blacks and made the injustice of the slave trade a national story. But the United States still refused to allow foreign vessels to search American vessels, so they established the United States Navy's African Squadron to hunt for slave ships off the west coast of Africa. In 1842, Secretary of State Daniel Webster and Alexander Baring, Lord Ashburton, met to settle a US-Canadian border dispute. However, another goal of this meeting was to apply diplomatic pressure on the United States to enforce its laws against the slave trade across the Atlantic. Signed on August 10th, 1842, the Webster-Ashburton Treaty, also called the Treaty of Washington, directed each nation to maintain a squadron on the west coast of Africa, 
to enforce its own laws relating to the illegal transatlantic slave trade, each force was required to carry a minimum of 80 guns in total. So they're not saying you need to put 10 ships or 50 ships. They're just saying 80 guns. That could be one ship with 80 guns or 80 ships with one gun. Uh, and so the two, the two nations will interpret that very differently. So though the trade was abolished in 1808, the US did not enforce it formally until the birth of the African squadron in 1842. From 1794 to 1820, Congress passed many acts to outlaw not only the transatlantic slave trade in the United States, but also the participation of any American citizen or vessel in the sale or transportation of slaves across the Atlantic. Now, as a matter of fact, the United States has the most severe law which punishes a, an American citizen engaging in the trade, uh, treating it as a capital crime. So it's, it's, it's the equivalent of piracy, which is uh, punishable by death. Unfortunately, without aggressive enforcement, the trade continued as slave traders and ship captains adopted secretive measures. So why did the United States refuse to allow the British to search American vessels suspected as slavers? The United States had historical fears of British interference in American trade and of the Royal Navy boarding American merchant vessels. During the Napoleonic Wars, which were not that long before, American vessels were routinely stopped and searched. American merchant sailors were often impressed into the service of the Royal Navy. The abuse of American vessels was the catalyst for an American declaration of war on Britain in 1812. 30 years later, many Americans were still suspicious of British interference in legal American commerce. And there you see this image. I forget uh, what battle this is during the War of 1812. I think it's Chesapeake versus Shannon, but you can see that the American vessel, which I believe to be the USS Chesapeake, is flying the flag at the foremast that reads, uh, you can barely see it, free trade and sailors' rights, which was a rallying cry of the United States and still very much in the American ideal. So here we are with an African squadron and I'm sorry to report that many historians would classify the squadron as a dismal failure. Before 1859, when Constellation arrives as flagship, it never numbered more than six vessels and did not include steamers. Such a small number of ships could not effectively patrol almost 3,000 miles of coastline. As a comparison, the Union Navy during the Civil War probably had over 500 ships just to blockade the South, uh, which was probably about 3,500 miles of coast. From 1842 to mid-1859, the U.S. African Squadron captured just 22 slave ships. Only one of these captured vessels contained slaves. That was the Ponds, which held about 913 Africans uh, when it was taken by the USS Yorktown in about 1844, I think. During a similar time period, the Royal Navy captured approximately 600 ships of various nations with over 40,000 captive Africans. The British actively used steamers and the squadron typically numbered between 14 and 24 vessels. So you see two very different commitments to the, uh, to the squadrons. Before 1859, the African squadron was typically made up of four vessels, usually a combination of sloops of war and two-masted brigs, and sometimes frigates. Now, a frigate is a very good ship to combat a man of war of a, of a rival navy. It is not really a good ship to go slave catching because it's too big. You don't need all those guns. Uh, and uh, if, it's, if it's only sail uh, powered, you're going to have a great disadvantage against fast ships or ships that have steam power. Um, so powered only by sail and carrying a large crew and heavy guns, these vessels were not suited to chasing the, the notoriously fast schooner rig clippers favored by slave traders. The small number of vessels was further weakened by the distant location of their supply depot, making it virtually impossible to spot a slaver. The supply depot for the African squadron was originally located on the island of Porto Praia in the Cape Verde Islands, 
you can see it uh, as the second red line there. Uh, this is 2,800 miles and a month's sail from the mouth of the Congo River, uh, the, uh, which was the center of slaving activity. It was chosen because of the fear that prolonged exposure at a depot on the shore of the African coast would increase the spread of fever among crews. Commanders routinely sailed to the Portuguese island of Madeira up there at the top, which was 3,500 miles from the Congo River. This is where they would give men liberty after a cruise on the coast. So a cruise from Porto Praia, the supply depot, to Madeira could take as long as a patrolling cruise down the slave coast. Cruisers spent as much time sailing to and from Porto Praia for resupply as they did cruising for slavers. Thus, less than half of this small squadron was on patrol at any time. The slave trade under the American flag continued at a high rate. During the 18 months in 1859 to 1860, no less than 85 slavers capable of transporting between 30 and 60,000 Africans were fitted out at New York alone. Greater resources were needed to stop these vessels. Many officers in the Royal Navy expressed frustration at the weak American presence and their own inability to seize American vessels. A British officer wrote in 1857 that for nearly three years, there has been no American cruiser in these waters, where a valuable and extensive American commerce is carried on. I cannot therefore but think that this continued absence of foreign cruisers looks as if they were intentionally withdrawn and as if the government did not care to take measures to prevent the American flag from being used to cover slave trade transactions. The biggest problem that the United States government directed was that the United States government directed the African squadron commanders to prioritize the protection of American commerce over the suppression of the slave trade. The naval presence off of Africa was meant to curb the embarrassment of American vessels engaging in the illegal trade being stopped at sea by the British. To make matters worse, back in the United States, slave traders were rarely tried and found guilty in federal courts. Those that were found guilty were rarely severely punished. Slave trading was a capital crime, but only one slaver was ever convicted and sentenced to death. This was Nathaniel Gordon in 1862. When the Buchanan administration finally did add more resources and demanded more efficient cruising, the squadron performed much better. And here you can see some of the results. <clears throat> Just to sum up, there are 14 slave ships captured in this 28 month period uh, with almost 4,000 Africans uh, liberated. It is appropriate to distinguish the service in Africa from the Navy's other squadron missions. Africa was known as a misery station because it had little to offer in the way of entertainment and adventure and much to endure in hardship. The weather was extremely hot and humid, reaching over 100 degrees along parts of the coast, uh, those closest to the equator. Calm ocean waters forced vessels to hug the coast in order to get a land or sea breeze. In March of 1861, one Constellation sailor reported that it was 113 degrees in the shade. The west coast of Africa was flat, it was forested, it had few harbors or notable landmarks to excite the sailor's imagination or bring him out of his monotony. There was nothing like the Acropolis of Greece or Mount Vesuvius in Naples to be seen. There were no seaports lined with dance halls or pubs like in New York or London. Master's mate John Lawrence of the USS Yorktown wrote, it is an undeniable truth that this station is becoming more and more irksome every day. The novelty that we first felt is wearing off fast from the monotony and repetition of the scenes and character of the savages. Pictured here is Commodore William Inman, flag officer, because there was no rank of admiral yet. He's flag officer of the African squadron during the period I'm discussing. He will not be an aggressive commander, but the Buchanan and Lincoln administrations will push him into action. Constellation departed the Charlestown Navy Yard for Africa, and here she is dry docked prior to her departure in July, 1859. The West Coast of Africa was notorious and feared as a disease-ridden place many called the white man's grave. The sickness found in Africa was known by many names, African fever, coast fever, yellow jack. 
The fever was actually malaria or yellow fever. 19th century sailors believed it was contracted from bad air in contact with the shore. The fever was the fiercest combatant faced by seamen off the coast, killing hundreds of sailors in the British and American squadrons in the 19th century. It did not affect the native Africans, thus the hiring of crewmen to do most of the ship to shore work. I'll talk about these individuals at the conclusion of this presentation. The symptoms of severe infection are high, uh, high fever, chills, headache, muscle aches, vomiting, and backache. After a brief recovery period, the infection can lead to shock, bleeding, and kidney and liver failure. Liver failure causes jaundice, which is a yellowing of the skin and the whiteness of the eyes, which gives yellow fever its name. A sailor aboard USS Marion wrote in 1858, we have no sickness aboard yet and I hope we never shall, for if yellow jack once gets hold of us, we will suffer for it in this hot climate and we are going to the right place for it. On the 13th, we sprinkled our birth deck with lime to cleanse and purify it. I forgot to state that it is customary for every man to have a friend on board a man of war. So if that one gets sick, the other one will look out for him, wash his clothes, etc. It is rather amusing to see an old tar picking out his chum. He must know he is a good fellow or he won't take him. Ships were directed to not anchor too close to the shore for fear of breathing bad air. Ironically, this helped prevent the spread of the disease. Although it was not known at the time, mosquitoes were the major transmitter of yellow fever, and mosquitoes did not fly far off the coastline. In 1844, during the early years of the squadron, the USS Preble anchored a quarter mile offshore to settle a dispute in modern Bissau. Soon afterwards, 46 sailors were put on the sick list and 16 eventually died from the fever. One Constellation sailor recalled the dramatic suffering of an infected sailor one night in 1861. All hands were kept awake by a young fellow that is sick with the coast fever. He is out of his head. His lungs must be in good condition for he hollered like a bull. The measures the US Navy employed definitely helped as reports of French ships contained alarming numbers of deaths from the disease. An indicator of how important sanitation and discipline was is when Constellation captured the slave brig Triton. A number of the slave ship's crew were sick with the fever while she was anchored up the Congo River waiting to embark slaves. Constellation put a crew on board this vessel to sail it and the criminals back to the United States. Constellation's captain's clerk, Stephen B. Wilson, was a member of the prize crew sailing Triton to Norfolk. and He contracted yellow fever aboard Triton, died, and was buried on Ascension Island in the South Atlantic Ocean. No doubt he was laid to rest in a coffin built by the ship's carpenter's mate. If you look at that red arrow there and you see the uh, white obelisk tombstone with rocks in front of it, that is the grave of Stephen B. Wilson, Constellation's captain's clerk on Ascension Island in a cemetery called Bonetta Cemetery. And Bonetta, I believe, was a British uh, Royal Navy uh, uh, ship in the African squadron at one point. Here, the disease proved to be a great obstacle to suppressing the slave trade and orders frequently demanded that captains and their crews not linger close to shore where they might sight and catch slavers loading their cargo. So now I wanna discuss Constellation's capture of the slave ship Cora. Argue, arguably the most dramatic incident in the ship's century of service. Flag officer Inman had captured one slave ship, the Delicia, in 1859, and he had overseen the building of a new supply station, which was closer to the mouth of the Congo River. So he intended to take Constellation north to the island of Madeira for a little vacation of sorts. He arrived there in March, and although I cannot prove anyone in the Navy Department read it, an article appeared in the New York Times on March 17, 1860, in which the correspondent attacked the African squadron's effectiveness. We have not only detailed an insufficient force heretofore, but that force has not been efficiently employed, he wrote. The reporter also revealed that American ships spent too much time resting at the beautiful, beautiful island of Madeira, over 3,500 miles from the Congo River. The reporter pointed to the irony of slave traders of all nations using the American flag to carry on this abominable traffic. 
with so few American vessels on patrol and no reciprocal right of search between Britain and America, the Stars and Stripes had become a shield against the Royal Navy. He, plead, he pleaded for more steamers, more time on the coast, and greater cooperation with British naval officers. Well, this seems to be the straw that broke the camel's back. The Buchanan administration had taken decisive action. Four days after the Times editorial, Secretary of the Navy Isaac Toosey sent a message to Inman, Inman to renew his exertions, and he ordered Constellation to return to the coast immediately. Within 10 days of this article, the administration declared Madeira and the Canary Islands as off limits to the United States Navy and restricted the cruising ground to an area closer to the Congo River. The message was clear. The African squadron needed to show results. So this is the tenor over the summer of 1860 when Constellation is cruising near the mouth of the Congo River. Meanwhile, on June 27, 1860, the bark Cora, and a bark is a, refers to the rigging of a ship. Uh, the first two masts are square rigged. They have square sails and the aftmost mast has triangular sails. So on June 27, 1860, the bark Cora departed New York bound for the West African coast on what would prove to be an ill-fated slaving voyage. After a decade of use in legal merchant activity, this 431-ton Baltimore clipper was sold by E.D. Morgan and Company to John Latham for $14,000. This here is the clipper Nightingale, and like the Cora, she was a merchantman engaged in the type of legal maritime trade that is part of the proud heritage of this nation. Most ships, you have to understand, are not built for the slave trade. How could they be? Nightingale was once one of the largest and fastest ships of the merchant marine, and her depiction here in New York Harbor is an image that evokes nostalgia, pride, economic prosperity, nationhood, culture, etc. In 1861, this beautiful ship will be captured off Africa by the USS Saratoga with 961 Africans on board. The ship Cora is part of this same tradition. So in May of 1860, John Latham took the bark to a pier on New York's East River to refit her rigging and load cargo. The cargo, containing large quantities of lumber, fresh water, and provisions, raised suspicions among local authorities that the owner intended to turn it into a slave ship. A U.S. District, district Attorney detained Cora for examination, but later cleared the bark for her voyage. All evidence that Cora was intended for a slaving voyage was held deep within the ship. Cora's hold contained 50 cases of muskets, likely intended to purchase slaves, more than 20 cases of drugs to treat a disease outbreak among African slaves, and 47 barrels of rice to feed the captives. Other suspicious cargo might include large copper boilers for cooking food, hundreds of wooden spoons, more spoons than the crew would need, swords, firearms, shackles, and chains. Other than the presence of imprisoned Africans, the most incriminating evidence that a ship was a slave ship was the presence of a false deck known as a slave deck or enough excess lumber on board the ship to build one. When Cora sailed for Africa, she contained over 10,000 feet of lumber. Since slave ships were originally built for legal trade, they needed to undergo substantial alterations to carry a human cargo. Thus, the slave deck, a middle deck built in between the hold and the upper deck, became the smoking gun for any vessel that had not yet loaded slaves. There you can see that dense packing I referred to in another illustration when we saw that broadside of the Brooks. On August 27th, the Cora arrived at Punta de Lenha, a major slave trading center 30 miles up the Congo River. Three weeks later, after having made all of the necessary arrangements, Latham sailed Cora to Mont Grand, where in the late hours of September 24th, he supervised the hasty loading of African slaves from the shore to a waiting ship. Once the slaves were loaded, Cora would sail for Cuba to unload her cargo. Now let's look at what is a typical slave ship capture in detail. 
On September 25th, 1860, Constellation parted company with the USS San Jacinto for a southerly cruise towards the Congo River. At 7.30 p.m., a lookout on the starboard side spotted the bark Cora about two miles out on Constellation's weather bow. The flagship changed course and began her pursuit. Midshipman Warburn Hall remembered, Constellation was simply superb in tacking, and round she came, raising her sharp bow from the sea like a racer ready for the signal. In an attempt to escape, Cora hauled up sharp on the wind, set all her canvas, and began evasive maneuvers. Sometime after 9 p.m., as the moon lit up the night sky, Constellation's starboard 32-pound long gun fired a shot across Cora's bow to signal her to heave to and prepare for boarding. Cora ignored the shot and raced along the coast. Constellation closed the gap to within about a half a mile and fired several more warning shots, but to no avail. In a desperate attempt to gain speed, the slaver's crew frantically began lightening ship. They threw an empty boat, hatches, anchors, spars, and casks into the ocean. Despite all of their efforts to lighten the load, the flagship continued to draw even closer. With one chance left, Cora cut across Constellation's bow in a final attempt to make it out to the open sea. Constellation's next shot cut away part of Cora's rigging and forced the bark to give up. A boarding party led by First Lieutenant Donald McNeil Fairfax, you see him there on the left, boarded Cora and immediately discovered 705 African slaves crammed together on the slave deck. This included men, boys, women, young girls, and babies. According to ordinary seaman William Leonard, he wrote, this being the first slaver I ever saw with slaves in, my curiosity led me upon the slave deck. The scene which here presented itself to my eyes baffles description. It was a dreadful sight. They were all packed together like so many sheep, men, women, and children entirely naked and suffering from hunger and thirst. They had nothing to eat or drink for over 30 hours. As soon as the poor Negroes were aware that we were friends to them, they commenced the shouting and yelling like so many wild Indians. They were so overjoyed at being taken by us that I thought they would tear us to pieces. Midshipman Wilburn Hall also recalled the revolting stench of so many men, women, and children crammed together with little or no sanitation. The young officer later wrote, the slaves were nearly all on the slave deck, shouting and screaming in terror and anxiety. I leaned over the main hatchway holding a lantern, and the writhing mass of humanity with their cries and struggles can only be compared in one's mind to the horrors of hell as pictured in former days. As the ship's hatches were opened, a landsman named William French, you can see him in the photo there as an old, uh, as an old man recalling his naval service, French recalled that the captives came tumbling out of the hole, yelling and cringing. They ran forward and crouched on the bow. They were nearly starved. Upon hearing that Cora was a slaver with hundreds of terrified Africans packed below, Constellation's crew let out a thunderous cheer. The crew, you see, was entitled to $25 for every recaptured African slave landed in Liberia, as well as a portion of the proceeds gained if the slave ship was sold at auction. By law, half of the proceeds for the ship sale went to the Naval Retirement Fund, but the other half was divided amongst the crew. In addition to the slaves themselves and the slave deck, there is plenty of suspicious evidence on the Cora. Some of it is detailed in that list I told you about earlier, but uh, members of Constellation's crew also discovered a passenger list. And this list of passengers and crew found on board lists a man named Loretta Ruiz and a number of other Spanish passengers. The existence of passengers as well as crew might raise suspicion. One newspaper reported it is a common trick of the master or owner of a slaver when seized to represent himself under an assumed name as a passenger. Captain Latham gave the name Loretta Ruiz and told Constellation's officers he was a Spanish passenger. There were seven Spanish men on board who were likely to become the crew for the voyage home. 
By sailing to Africa under the American flag, they could avoid seizure by the Royal Navy and took their chances with the tiny American squadron. But once slaves were loaded on board, the vessel was often sold to a foreign crew to avoid a death sentence in an American trial. A slave ship was also likely to contain double sets of registry papers, an extra false logbook, flags of various nationalities to confuse an American warship, and forged American consular seals to avoid detainment by the Royal Navy. Taking the slaver corps was just the first step, since now the US Navy was responsible for the livelihood of the captured slaves. On the 27th of September, sailors from Constellation finished repairing Cora's rigging for the journey back to the United States. Inman ordered a prize crew of 11 sailors and three Marines led by Master Thomas Eastman, pictured there on the left, to sail the bark to Norfolk, Virginia for adjudication. Excuse me, adjudication. The crew first sailed to Liberia and delivered the Africans into the custody of Reverend John Sees, the United States agent for recaptured Africans. Despite the measures to improve living conditions and orders to enable them to have as much pure air as possible, 11 Africans died before reaching their destination. Now, the Republic of Liberia was the designated haven for Africans on board slave ships seized by the United States Navy. There was no single home to return the rescued slaves to, and many American officials feared that returning them to the Congo River Basin would only result in their recapture and resale as slaves. So the US government supported their relocation to Liberia. Local committees assisted the traumatized Africans who were called Congos after their arrival. Many of the Africans were apprenticed to America Liberian families. Over 200 of the Africans liberated from Cora settled in Carysburg where they performed millwork. Between August and October, 1860, Liberia was overwhelmed with some 3,600 freed slaves. The African squadron's recent success in such a short span of time taxed Liberia's ability to care for the new arrivals. Some of the Congos apprenticed that year ran away and a small number committed suicide. With no family or friends and no way to return home, most conformed to the dominant culture and adopted new lives. Now, Master Eastman departed Monrovia and headed to Norfolk to deliver Cora's uh, first mate, Morgan Fredericks, second mate John Wilson and third mate Hans Olsen into the custody of the United States Marshal. Due to adverse weather, he sailed Cora to New York and anchored off the Brooklyn Navy Yard on December 8th, 1860. The evidence was damning and the US District Court in New York confiscated Cora and auctioned the bark for $8,900. On March 7th, 1861, Cora was seized once more for suspicion as a slaver, this time by the revenue cutter Harriet Lane. Some of Cora's officers did not wait for a verdict on their guilt. Less than 24 hours after Cora's arrival in New York, Morgan Fredericks broke out of his stateroom, climbed through a porthole, or so, uh, so we were told, and plunged into the East River. Many suspect he was actually helped uh, by a deputy marshal uh, to escape. Captain John Latham was brought to New York in the United States store ship Relief. After the court denied his bail, a mysterious friend negotiated Latham's furlough from a prison to buy him a suit at Brooks Brothers on Broadway. The Tombs prison you see pictured there is where Latham was held. While the deputy marshal who escorted Latham was himself trying on a suit, Latham and his friend escaped in a carriage waiting outside. Mates John Wilson and Hans Olsen denied knowledge that they were serving on a slaving voyage until they reached Africa. They pled guilty to violating the Act of 1800, a lesser crime of voluntary service aboard a slaver, and the court sentenced them to 10 months in prison with a fine of $500 each. Four other seamen were brought into court, but their cases were dismissed. While all of these court proceedings were taking place, the U.S. Constellation stayed on station and captured one more slave ship, the Brig Triton, on May 21st, 1861. On August 11th, she set sail for the United States for reassignment. The Civil War had been raging for months and Constellation was needed elsewhere. The crew of divided sympathies would have an uneasy cruise back across the Atlantic. 
During the Civil War, the ship protected commerce and served diplomatic functions as part of the Mediterranean Squadron. Occupied by a war on American soil, the Lincoln administration finally agreed to allow the Royal Navy to search American vessels suspected to be slavers. This Anglo-American treaty was signed on June 7, 1862. The African Squadron was no more. During the period that Constellation was flagship, the squadron captured 14 slave ships and freed almost 4,000 Africans from a life of servitude in the Americas. In just over two years, Commodore Inman's cruisers conducted nearly half of all captures made during the squadron's entire career from 1842 to 61. The Navy achieved these results by increasing the number of vessels on station. Inman had eight ships, normally there were four. They introduced smaller steam-powered vessels. In fact, Inman had four steam-powered vessels. They relocated the supply depot from the distant island of Porto Praia to St. Paul de Luanda, which was south of the Congo River. And they restricted the boundaries of the cruising ground. More aggressive cruising and better cooperation with the Royal Navy were also important factors. Unfortunately, squadron commanders were ordered to prioritize the protection of American commerce over the suppression of the slave trade, which hampered their success with the latter. As one elderly slave smuggler, smuggler affirmed in 1856, there was so much profit in smuggling slaves from Africa that even if you should hang all the Yankee merchants engaged in it, hundreds would fill their places. According to this expert in the trade, there was only one possible solution. Take the word of a dying man, he said. There is no way the slave trade can be stopped but by breaking up slaveholding. The US Navy's African squadron was temporarily canceled during the Civil War with the British Royal Navy given permission to board and search American ships. To make an example in support of the Union's anti-slavery policies, President Abraham Lincoln hung one American slave captain named Nathaniel Gordon on February 21st, 1862. Considering that many other equally guilty slave traders were quietly let off with light sentences, this conviction was described as obviously a fluke. Once the Confederacy was defeated, slavery in America was finally abolished once and for all. With increased efforts of the Royal Navy, plus Cuba's abolition of the slave trade in 1867, the transatlantic slave trade was dealt a destructive blow. Although the end of the trade was mainly the result of breaking up slaveholding, should not be forgotten that during the preceding two decades, U.S. Navy ships like the USS Constellation played a significant role in the American effort to combat this transatlantic slave trade on the open seas. In December 1865, the Navy Department created a West Indian squadron based on the argument that slave ships could be apprehended as effectively off the Cuban coast as off of Africa. Now that all of the North American slave markets were closed to slave ships arriving from Africa, in 1869, the British government decided to abolish the Royal Navy's West African Squadron because there were no more slave ships to catch. Although French and Portuguese slave traders continued to participate to some degree in the transatlantic slave trade, by the 1870s, it had dwindled to insignificance nearly everywhere in the Atlantic. And finally, while images of the slave trade are appropri appropriately associated with the African slaves who endured unspeakable horrors of the Middle Passage on their way to North and South America, very little has been written about the role some West African seafarers played in combating the transatlantic slave trade. For decades, commanders of the African squadron employed crewmen, K-R-O-O-M-E-N, to serve as auxiliary seamen, lightermen, longshoremen to transport men and supplies from ship to shore. Crewmen were recruited from shore often on a first come first serve basis. Renowned for their physical strength, they often worked in the nude or just with a cloth wrapped around their waist. 40 crewmen served on board Constellation and they are a reminder that Africans were not just victims across the continent, but actors and agents in support of the suppression of the slave trade. Motivated by profit, perhaps more than social justice, but I wanted to leave you with their image as a reminder that there are so many Navy stories untold, and theirs is one of them. Thank you. I would now love to entertain any questions. Thank you, John. I'm, I'm hearing that maybe you have more stories to share with us another time, and that would be great.
Uh, I feel like I learned a lot. I imagine I'm not the only one. Uh, we've had so far one question and one comment. Uh, one of our Norfolk Historical Society members is a former commander of the USS Constitution. <laughs> that must I be think Chris. You know what I'm talking about, I bet. <laughs> um, he commented that he attended the funeral of the last surviving commanding officer of the um, later of the constellation, um, Commander Christensen. Um, who Christensen had the honor of commanding both the Constellation and the Constitution. Yes. So those yes. ships are very tied together. Yes, very much so. Um, and the question that we have, um, you mentioned that Liberia being the, uh, the port where the American African squadron would take the slaves that they had rescued off of the captured ships what about um, the British slave, uh, the, the British ships? They went to Sierra Leone. That was their okay. port. Okay. Yep. So that was, what did you say, about 9,000 and some? Um, um, well, slaves. in the period that we're discussing, I think 30, there were almost 4,000 that went in that 28-month uh -huh. okay. period. But then there were, you know, there were more over the years. So Sierra Leone, thank Sierra you. Sierra Leone was for the for the royal where the Royal Navy would take recaptured Africans. Yeah, and you touched on this, but I'm still not completely clear. The American, um, the African squadron, uh, funding because they of uh, the commercial ventures seem to be the priority rather than actually funding the squadron. Yeah, so you know, in every time a flagship takes command of the squadron, they're issued orders or, or instructions from the Secretary of the Navy. And they often repeat themselves. If you go to the archives and look, they constantly use the language, protect American commerce and end suppress the slave trade. But the slave trade is the, the actions to actually hunt for slave ships were secondary. The primary okay. reason that the United States Navy was out there was to keep British ships off of legal American ships. Gotcha. So that was a secondary thing. Right. Wow. Well, thank and you. Ironically, ironically, as someone reminded me not too long ago, you know, Constellation being built in Norfolk in 1853 and through to 1855, she was built partially by slave labor. And it's interesting that she's out fighting the transatlantic slave trade less than a decade later. Well, you're right. That's, that's, I had not thought of that. That's another really fascinating connection though. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions. So um, thank you so much. Uh, this was just really fascinating. Okay, well, I hope I didn't bore anybody to death and I thank you very much for inviting me. Yep, and I think everybody of... hung in there. Um, <laughs> I expect we'll have you back another time. Um, oh, I would love to, to talk plumb about your brain Vietnam another exhibit. Time. I would love to talk about the Hampton Roads Naval Museum's uh, Vietnam exhibit. Uh, I encourage everybody to go see it. We are free and open to the public. Uh, to my knowledge, it's the only exhibit in the country specifically uh, devoted to the Navy's contribution to the Vietnam War, which was substantial. So uh, I encourage you all to see it. It is filled with oral histories from Navy veterans uh, who are there to tell their story. And uh, hopefully uh, I'll come back and talk about that exhibit and share some of those oral histories with you. We um, will absolutely invite you back. I also have someone who strongly recommended a book for people to read uh, for more information, a book called Sweetwater and Bitter. The ships okay. that stopped the slave trade. Oh, I'm not familiar with that. Thank you very much. And the author's name is, I guess it's Sean Reese, S I A N, and the last name Reese, R E E S. So that's further reading for all oh, of thank us. Thank you so much. Yeah, there's been a lot of uh, scholarship in the last decade that I have not caught up with. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure. But this was great. Um, I will invite everyone to visit us again on October 13th for our October webinar. Um, also, this, this session has been recorded and you are invited to go onto the Norfolk Historical Society's website, which is www.norfolkhistorical.org.
org in a day or two. Uh, this recording will be um, viewable as well as our previous webinars back to January. So you can see it again, send the link to a friend. And again, John Pentangelo, thank you so much. I expect we'll see you again. I hope so. Thank you. Thank Have a good you. night, everyone. And thank you all for coming. Good night.